Hello, everyone. I'm your host today, Dr. Muhammad Sami. I'm a nephrologist in Ithaca, New York. Um, first, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And uh, I want to thank, in particular, Amanda Allen. She's the district liaison for the different districts in our chapter in New York State. I want to thank the president of our New York State chapter, the upstate governor, my fellow district presidents, the audience, physicians and non-physicians alike. Thanks, everyone. Um, we live in the coronavirus pandemic, but we can't overlook the um, big epidemic that we lived with for the past two or three decades. Um, over the past um, years, we've seen patients that we know, fellow healthcare workers that suffered from this. Between 1999 and 2017, hundreds of thousands of patients lost their lives from drug overdose related to opioids, whether prescription or illicit abuse. Our uh, fellow physicians and nurses and healthcare providers suffer from this condition too. But there are a few things that we can do, and that's why we invited Dr. Judy Griffin. She is an internist and an addiction physician who's a graduate from the Montefiore Residency Program, and she did her medical school at Cornell at Columbia University. Please all of you join me in welcoming Dr. Griffin. She's the research director at the REACH program uh, in upstate New York. Judy. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Sammy. Um, I'll just start by saying it's a pleasure to be here uh, to speak for the Southern Tier chapter of the ACP. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today about our work. Um, and um, happy to see a lot of familiar faces, but look forward to meeting those of you who I don't know as well and hoping that today's talk really provides some background, some of the evidence base, as well as our experience at REACH Medical uh, based in Ithaca, New York, um, and that it invites a rich conversation around what we can do as clinicians to address the overdose epidemic uh, that we're facing today. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me one moment as we de delve further into Zoomlandia here. Okay. Great. So are you all seeing my screen, uh, my slides? Yeah, great. Yes. Great. So, you know, we posed the question, how do we tackle the opioid epidemic uh, in 2021? Um, I think focusing on some background, but also solutions, we do have a lot of tools in our toolkit. So that's what I hope we can talk more about today. Oops. Some of our objectives include explaining an overview and background of the overdose epidemic, illustrating the evidence-based interventions that exist uh, to treat substance use disorders, including opioid use disorder with medications, and talk more about the REACH medical model, uh, which is an innovative approach to providing equity-informed and harm reduction-based medical care to people with substance use disorders and others who face stigma in the healthcare setting. And we hope that our, our model can serve as a example of a, a way forward. Um, some background that many may be aware, but um, just to start with the basics, substance use disorder is a complex, chronic, recurring, sort of relapsing, remitting disease that affects a lot of people. Um, close to 20 million adults in the United States meet diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder. That would include things like alcohol use disorder, um, opioid use disorder, and other uh, use disorders, and those can co-occur also. Um, specifically with opioid use disorder, we know that over 1.6 million adults have opioid use disorder. Uh, so this affects millions of people. And as Dr. Sammy said, including uh, many friends, family, and colleagues uh, that we all know. But we do know a lot about some best practice management for opioid use disorder that is multifaceted and focuses on prevention, screening for substance use disorders in a variety of settings, including primary care settings um, and other settings taking, uh, having empathy patients and meeting people where, where they're at. We'll talk more about what that looks like. Medications for opioid use disorder, like I mentioned, which are um, extremely effective and reduce uh, morbidity and mortality related to substance use, including IV drug use. 
Um, ongoing monitoring and support, viewing this condition as a chronic disease, like we would other chronic diseases, um, including diabetes or high blood pressure. And then um, learning more about something called harm reduction, um, which is an approach that can be really impactful in terms of reducing complications from substance use in a setting where a patient has ongoing use. And that, that's something that we as physicians and other healthcare workers can implement in our clinical practice. So um, a little bit of the background in terms of overdose deaths that Dr. Sammy alluded to over the past two decades, we really saw essentially three phases of the overdose epidemic play out in the last two decades. The, the initial um, wave was related to prescription opioids that most of us are familiar with, um, Oxycontin and other prescription opioids driving new overdose related deaths, um, which essentially has transitioned over the last decade to other opioids, non-prescribed opioids, including heroin initially, and now synthetic opioids um, other than methadone, including and primarily fentanyl. So people using illicit fentanyl um, as the primary um, opioid and the biggest driver of overdose death um, that we see currently. And that's that real spike in that orange line that you see at the top on the right side of the graph. Um, so we saw, we saw the trends over the last two decades. And then this, um, this data came out recently, which was looking at the, the tremendous spike we saw during 2020 in overdose deaths. Um, that increased nationally around 30% from previously record levels of 72,000 deaths um, in 2019 to over 90,000 deaths um, in 2020. And I fear, you know, just anecdotally from my clinical practice that 2021 um, will follow a similar trend. So we've really just seen an ongoing upward trend and a real spike uh, in 2020. And this graph illustrates um, that that spike can be attributed to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. So when you break the data down by month, what you see is, you know, the trends were, if anything, going down around February 2020. And then starting in April 2020 is where we see this upward trend related to total overdose death increases and overdose deaths related specifically to opioids um, and synthetic opioids in particular. So it's really uh, an epidemic within the pandemic that we're seeing play out. This looks at the increases in overdose death um, during 2020 by state. And like I said, nationally, we saw a 30% increase in overdose death between 2019 and 2020, um, but that didn't play out equally in all states. Um, virtually all states showed um, increase in overdose death, but um, unfortunately we saw dramatic increases in the states that have been hardest hit throughout the opioid epidemic, including West Virginia, um, Kentucky, Tennessee, states that we know have been hard hit throughout. New York State actually saw a 37% increase in overdose death uh, from what I um, could gather. Um, and so what we know is that this is playing out in New York State, it's playing out in the Southern tier. Um, Tompkins County, where Ithaca is located, is relatively um, less affected than surrounding counties, including Broome County, Tioga County, Seneca County, Cuyahoga County, who are all extremely hard hit. Um, and counties in, in up, farther upstate, farther northern New York, um, it's even worse. Um, we work in over 40 counties in New York State. Um, and so, you know, we know locally it's a, it's a huge issue, but in counties that have even less access to treatment and services, it's, it's far worse. Um, you know, so Dr. Sammy raised a really important point, which is that this condition, opioid use disorder and substance use disorders more broadly impacts everyone. Um, it sort of doesn't discriminate. Um, although we know that the, the fallout and complications disproportionately impact um, people, um, like all health conditions, but we know that 10 to 15% of healthcare professionals will misuse drugs or alcohol during their career. And that 36% of physicians enrolled in sort of programs for their substance use, it is for opioid use disorder. 
So um, disproportionately impacts the specialties that I think a lot of us are, you know, are aware of this anesthesia, emergency medicine, and psychiatry. And one thing I wanted to highlight is that the stigma and, and even overt discrimination that impacts our patients in accessing care um, impacts our colleagues and, and you know, that many healthcare workers are prohibited from accessing evidence-based treatments, including medications for opioid use disorder. Um, and just imagine if there were a chronic disease, another chronic disease in which a physician, you know, had to decide, do I take life-saving medication for cancer or do I work as a physician? And that's the choice that many physicians with opioid use disorder and other healthcare workers like nurses and others face. Um, I know because I have patients who are healthcare workers with opioid use disorder. Um, I think it's changing, um, but this is a huge problem and it relates to stigma. And so, you know, this is something we should all be aware of and work towards changing. Um, so I mentioned that substance use disorder impacts people from all walks of life, um, which is true, absolutely. But what we know is that the that substance use disorder plays out um, in that it translates into tremendous health disparities for other chronic conditions for people with substance use disorders and is a big driver of health inequity. So in New York State, among um, individuals enrolled in managed Medicaid plans, Patients with substance use disorder had the greatest level of health disparities and the worst health outcomes compared to patients without substance use disorder for a variety of chronic diseases like COPD and diabetes, even compared to other sort of um, patient level characteristics, including race, ethnicity, um, or serious mental illness. So it's a big driver of health inequity and health disparities for other chronic conditions in people with substance use disorder. So having a substance use disorder can be a barrier to receiving treatment uh, for other forms of healthcare needs. So again, something to really important to be aware of and to understand in order to reach our patients with effective treatments for their substance use disorder, but also for their other chronic conditions. Um, and like, like all health conditions, we know that someone's identity can impact how they receive care, if they're even able to receive care, um, and what their health outcomes could be. And, and with this, you know, we think about, um, you know, a person with substance use disorder, a person of color faces even more barriers in accessing care and will likely face more stigma and discrimination. What we know is that in New York State, um, Black and Latinx patients with opioid use disorder have the highest risk of overdose, yet they face, uh, they receive the lowest level of referral and retention and treatment. So they're, they're both at higher risk and uh, receive less care. So it's, um, it's something that we as physicians in New York uh, need to address. Um, we can't address the overdose epidemic without taking into account uh, racism in medicine, transphobia in medicine, uh, homophobia in medicine. All of these things impact uh, a patient and their ability to access care for their substance use disorder. Um, so they're all important to, um, to address simultaneously. And that's sort of related to something that we at REACH Medical um, know is so critical in terms of engaging our patients in care, retaining our patients in care, which is the social determinants of health. Um, it's something that you know, people are probably very aware of. It does get talked about a lot, but sometimes it's hard to sort of understand how it directly relates to healthcare. So that's something I'm going to talk more about and break down when we talk about the REACH medical model. But for those of you who do know or just need a refresher, you know, the social determinants of health are things like um, where someone lives, their neighborhood, and what that physical environment is like, someone's level of education, um, economic stability, employment, um, food access or insecurity, their community, and then the healthcare system that is in their community. All of these things are um, tremendous drivers of health outcomes. And so, you know, this kind of breaks down the impact that these different determinants can have on someone's health outcomes. So it's important that we, we know this. So healthcare delivery affects, you know, has about a 20% impact. Um, Whereas someone's socioeconomic factors like 
their community, their employment, their level of education have a 40% impact. So, you know, we can't change all of these things, but we do need to know about them, take them into account. Um, one thing that I always keep in mind is sort of housing. Um, and this happened when I was a resident at Montefiore, you know, taking care of patients living in a homeless shelter with diabetes, knowing that they really couldn't easily fill a prescription for insulin and keep and store that medication safely and, and use syringes to inject insulin. And the same plays out uh, with my patients up here in Ithaca. So it's a reality that someone's housing, their housing insecurity plays a tremendous role in how they can receive and engage in care. And so it's something to be aware of and take into account as you're coming up with a treatment plan. And, you know, all of these things interact on so many different levels. And this is sort of a, a slide taken from public health. Um, but I think it's nice, nice to keep in mind that, you know, we as clinicians often work downstream, but we need to think about things upstream as well that impact our patients and their outcomes, um, including policies, regulations, um, and other community-based um, organizations that our patients may come in contact with. And so we as physicians can actually uh, play a critical role for advocating for our patients as they navigate these systems. And even, you know, particularly around things like policy and lobbying, you know, we have a tremendously powerful voice, um, you know, and it's my, my firm belief that we need to use and articulate that voice collectively in order to advocate for our patients. Um, so that we can prescribe and provide evidence-based treatments. That's, that's the only, if we don't do that, we won't, um, we won't bend the curve on, on the overdose epidemic. Um, so that's, that's sort of the groundwork. Um, next, I'm gonna go through some of the evidence-based approaches that exist um, and what is the evidence for those. So, you know, that's sort of the good news or silver lining here, I would say, is that when it comes to opioid use disorder, we have um, a wealth, years, decades of evidence pointing us to treatments that reduce mortality upwards of 50 to 80 percent, really effective, safe, um, and well-studied treatments that work. Um, so that's, that's really wonderful. We just need to implement them. Um, and when we implement them, we have to implement them in a way that works for our patients. But, you know, this is a list of evidence-based inter interventions put out by the CDC, and just going through them, they're sort of very um, straightforward and no shockers here, you know, targeted naloxone distribution, getting naloxone, which is Narcan, the overdose uh, reversal medication that can be easily administered by a lay person, comes in a sort of a nasal spray formulation that is similar to, um, you know, like an allergy nasal spray, really easy to use um, and life-saving, but it needs to be in the hands of people who around people who use drugs or um, have substance use disorders or take chronic opioids. So uh, this should really exist out in the community and we can prescribe it. So it's a medication we can make accessible to patients and normalize as well. Medications for opioid use disorder, I'll go into more about this. And this is really, I think, critical to our approach. And those medications include methadone, buprenorphine, or what's known as suboxone, um, and naltrexone. So we have multiple medications at our disposal, although each of them has unique barriers, uh, but they're all you know, really easy to prescribe um, and really effective. Ac academic detailing, actually to look that one up, but it's really just providing, you know, um, as opposed to um, sort of commercial detailing, or you know, we just need to, to talk to our colleagues and teach people how to use these medicines and it can really help eliminating prior authorization requirements for medications for opioid use disorder. We still face this in New York state. Um, you know, in other states, I think it's absolutely worse. Um, so we're lucky to be in New York state, but I can see a patient prescribed Suboxone, their treatment could be delayed by up to three days because I have to fight to get them a prior authorization to start a life-saving medication. Uh, screening for fentanyl, what fentanyl test strips, 911 Good Samaritan laws saying that someone can't be uh, face criminal um, charges related to substance use if they call 911 in the setting of an overdose. Uh, naloxone distribution in treatment centers and criminal justice settings, as well as MOUD in criminal justice settings and upon release. So um, it's pretty shocking the lack of availability of, of evidence-based treatment um, 
in criminal justice settings when we know that over 50% of people in jails have either a serious mental illness or a substance use disorder. Um, and even in New York State, you know, so if someone's in a county that does not, a county jail that doesn't offer Suboxone, I, this happens to my patients all the time, they're on Suboxone, they end up in jail, re usually related to some sort of technical violation. Uh, so not committing a new crime, but some sort of just um, non-criminal based offense related to substance use frequently can end up in a jail in a county that does not offer Suboxone. I can call as a physician and advocate for that person as much as I want. Uh, it doesn't matter, they're gonna go through withdrawal in jail. Um, and if they get transferred to prison, New York State prison, not on Suboxone, they will not get treatment. And so luckily on Monday, I had a, a patient of ours we hadn't seen in three years. He had been in state prison since 2018, but he remembered us, he only saw us three times before he went to prison. He called me from the car, not me personally, he called Reach, but I saw him uh, from the car. He had been released from prison after three years. Uh, the first call he made was to us um, because he wanted to stay on the right track. He knew that he needed Suboxone in order to really stay alive. We know that the overdose risk um, is 12 times, uh, is increased by 12 times the two weeks following release from incarceration. So I prescribed him Suboxone and Naloxone and, um, you know, he very hopeful that he will do extremely well with those evidence-based treatments. Um, but that's not available to everyone. And that is changing. There are laws and, you know, Kelly would definitely talk more about that, but, you know, there are laws that have been passed and hopefully will be implemented so that across New York state, MOUD is offered in criminal justice settings. It's a huge, huge issue. Um, and then initiating buprenorphine, uh, based MOUD in emergency departments. Again, a lot of evidence to support if someone pr presents the emergency room and is either found to meet diagnostic criteria for opioid use disorder based on the DSM-5 or presenting after an overdose should be at least offered buprenorphine um, with um, referral to outpatient-based treatment. And then syringe service programs, which is a form of harm reduction, um, you know, providing uh, folks access to safe um, and sterile syringes and needles uh, while using injection drugs is critical to improving health outcomes. So um, these are a bunch of slides that essentially just show that over decades, so this is a paper from Lancet from 2003, showing that buprenorphine compared to detox, you know, leads to tremendous retention and treatment and tremendous, abs you know, uh, urine toxicologies that show successful treatment um, with buprenorphine maintenance compared to detox. And, you know, notably in this cohort, 20% of the people in detox died. Uh, so not only is detox not effective, it's harmful. Um, and we need to know this because I think a lot of us didn't learn about addiction in medical school or residency. And we think someone going to rehab, going to detox, those are solutions that are evidence-based when there's limited evidence to support at least abstinence-based uh, detox, whereas there's a tremendous amount of support in terms of the medication. So this is another study uh, published by David uh, Phelan, who is at Yale. He's a leader in the field in JAMA 2014, comparing maintenance to taper, looking at retention in care over 14 weeks. This is a randomized clinical trial outcome, you know, and you can just see that tapering someone off of this uh, buprenorphine maintenance leads to uh, reduction in retention and treatment. And that translates into, that can translate into relapse and even death. Um, you know, at a more at a population level, this looked at uh, the implementation of MOUD in Baltimore. And what you really saw that at the bottom, the green dashed is buprenorphine. So as the number of buprenorphine patients increased uh, tremendously between 2002 and 2009, you saw kind of a corresponding um, an inversely related reduction in overdose deaths uh, starting about the same time in conjunction with the availability of methadone and increasing access to methadone as well. And it really, um, while this played out, they saw an 80% reduction in overdose death. And then um, this is a meta-analysis published in BMJ, which compiled data from hundreds of thousands of people in methadone and buprenorphine treatment comparing uh, individuals in and out of treatment 
And you know what it shows is that for patients on methadone um, in treatment, uh, compared to out of treatment, there was a five times increase in mortality among those out of methadone treatment and a three times increase for buprenorphine. Uh, so tremendous amount of information supporting our work. Um, in terms of reduction in mortality, so we're talking about mortality, you know, gold standard outcome here, uh, post-incarceration. Uh, this is looking at 32 prisons in the UK uh, for patients receiving what's what they call here OST, um, you know, op opioid substitution treatment, or the similar, it's basically the same thing as MOUD, another way of putting it. Um, they saw a 75% decrease in all cause mortality and 85% decrease in overdose related mortality following re release from prison. Um, this, you know, is more information that detox and abstinence aren't effective. Um, and 83% 83, 83 of people uh, will relapse within 30 days following a detox. So it's just not an effective form of treatment and it's not something that we should be uh, routinely offering patients. Another comparative effectiveness type study from Sarah Wakeman at Harvard, another uh, leader in the field published in JAMA in 2020. Um, she compared 40,000 adults across the United States um, who are presenting to uh, the hospital and had a diagnosis of opioid use disorder and sort of followed them over three months and saw which interventions were offered and which uh, were associated with a reduction in overdose, as well as uh, presenting back to the ED or hospital. And really the bottom line is the only thing that led to a reduction in overdose was buprenorphine or methadone, and that reduced overdose by close to 80%. Um, whereas inpatient detox or residential services, you know, actually showed an increase, non-statistically significant increase in acute care services. So um, this is just more kind of redundancy in the fact that we have a lot of evidence to support MOUD. And the good news is that um, in April of 2021, the Biden administration offered guidance saying that all uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs are able to prescribe buprenorphine to up to 30 patients at a time without undergoing the eight hour X waiver training. Um, and so sort of without the X, um, the full training, they can prescribe buprenorphine to 30 folks. All you have to do to get started is submit a notice of intent to um, the DEA and an X number will be issued. So I would encourage everyone to do that. Um, one thing we know though, in terms of answering our question, how do we you know, combat the overdose epidemic, it, treatment alone won't um, bend the curve enough, uh, won't save enough lives. And so um, this is a nice study from one of our research collaborators, Bruce Shackman, who's based at Weill Cornell, um, showing that in their model, really the only thing that reduced overdose, overdose by 40%, which was the goal set by HHS by 2022, is a combination of interventions, including increasing capacity and access to MOUD, improving retention on MOUD, and increasing naloxone distribution. So that's really, you need all of those things um, so we need to know about harm reduction because it's life-saving intervention and it's ubiquitous. You know, we do harm reduction all the time. We wear seatbelts, um, you know, we wear sunscreen. These things are meant to reduce the negative consequences of a behavior that probably has, you know, has benefits and also risks associated with it. Um, but, you know, in terms of a definition, it's really a, a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing the negative consequences associated with drug use. Um, harm reduction is a social movement um, built on social justice and the belief that, um, you know, respect for and rights of people who use drugs. So it's it, the term harm reduction, it was born out of, um, you know, grassroots efforts uh, among people who use drugs during the HIV epidemic to make their own uh, community safer. Um, and so that's where the we really take our lead is from people living with this um, condition and you know their voices are critical to how we implement solutions too. Um, but really there's, there's principles and then there's practical applications. Um, but we really need to, uh, 
to accept people with substance use disorder as they are and treat them with dignity, respect, and compassion, just like we would want any of our family members to be treated and how we'd hopefully treat all patients. Um, but what we know is that harm reduction has been shown to reduce transmission of bloodborne infections like HIV and hepatitis C, as well as reduce other complications of IV drug use like endocarditis. Um, and it also reduces overdose, both fatal and non-fatal. So these are critical interventions. And what we really absolutely know is that it is a gateway to treatment for those who want it. Um, and it's a gateway to stability for those who continue to use. Um, and so, um, you know, people accessing services through Schindler Exchange programs are frequently returned for services. So there's a high level of engagement um, and it can be an opportunity to reach people and engage people. And, and you know, we at REACH absolutely do this because we know there's so many barriers to treatment for patients, unfortunately. Um, the, the number one barrier truly is stigma. And what is, you know, stigma? It's sort of a prevailing attitude and belief that addiction is a moral failing, not a chronic medical condition. Um, and there's stigma abounds in healthcare settings. There's also a sort of internalized stigma or community-based stigma. And treatment itself can have stigma. So people can um, have the belief that being on medication, MOUD like buprenorphine, is somehow a different form of recovery than abstinence. Um, and so, you know, something to be aware of to talk about with your patients. Um, but there's other factors that lead to patients not being able to engage in care, um, mistrust of doctors and healthcare providers, usually based on their own experiences where they face discrimination and mistreatment. Um, you know, overall abstinence only orientation is, you know, is absolutely one of the outcomes that patients may strive for, but as a chronic relapsing remitting condition, you know, we, most, we know most patients have up and ups and downs and that has to be normalized. Um, rigid rules, people being kicked out, all these things uh, really lead to people dying um, and we need to eliminate this type of approach. Um, so one thing to be you know, mindful of um, is that word, our words matter. That's true in all forms of patient care. Um, and I, as they continually work as a doctor, I learn every day I have to be uh, so um, mindful of what I say because it's so impactful on patients. But in particular, certain words and language uh, should never be used um, by us as, as physicians. Um, you know, I never would dictate to a person with a substance use disorder how they refer to themselves. Um, you know, and that would go for those of you uh, in this audience who do have a substance use disorder, but I personally don't use the term addict, abuser, or junkie. Um, you know, I think the term abuse is one that sometimes people have a hard time understanding why that would be stigmatizing. Uh, so saying substance abuse, which is actually not the current uh, language used in the DSM. So it really has no um, place in our lexicon. You can say misuse or, or simply use and describe it objectively. A person uses this much alcohol. Um, but the reason abuse really is, is troubling um, was explained by Tom Hill, who's a person with lived experience. Uh, he's a social worker and he's also currently a senior policy advisor to, to President Biden. And he explained it that you know, he himself was the victim of child abuse. You know, he was abused as a kid and he never abused anyone. And then he was labeled an abuser because of his substance use disorder. And that was absolutely traumatizing for him that someone would label him an abuser. So it, it, for me, that really hit home why that term abuse has no place uh, in, our, in our discussion of substance use. Um, and other things uh, you know, around neonatal opioid withdrawal, um, you know, addicted baby. And I've heard this. So these things are commonly said, um, clean or dirty, you know, it, it's sometimes easy to fall into that type of language, but it, it really implies, you know, things about our patients that we, we absolutely should not. Um, so we have a lot of tools in our toolkit and um, tell you more about what we do at REACH briefly. So uh, REACH Medical, REACH stands for Respectful, equitable access to compassionate healthcare. 
Um, it was formed in 2017, opened to the public in 2018, became an OASIS licensed treatment um, facility in 2020. And we exist to serve individuals who face stigma in the healthcare setting because um, many patients do, and certainly patients with use disorders, but we serve all individuals um, regardless of their ability to pay um, or if they have a substance use disorder. Um, and what are the fundamental um, sort of characteristics of our model of care? We provide low threshold, non-stigmatizing care in a harm reduction framework. So what that really means is that we make it easy for our patients to reach us, to call us, to get on medication, to stay on medication. We don't, we're very aware of stigma, language, um, and we provide a safe and welcoming environment that's really focused on our patient's strengths. Um, and harm reduction framework means that we're, we're constantly um, providing counseling um, and other interventions and normalizing ups and downs in substance use disorder uh, to keep our patients alive. So every single day I talk to patients about co-prescribing naloxone and everyone tells me I don't need that. And I just say, you know, that's, that's sort of, and, and I get that um, there's tremendous stigma if they go to the pharmacy to pick up naloxone, but um, you know, I just say, you know, you may know someone out there who needs this and you could save someone's life. And that tends to resonate with people. I'm sure there's different approaches that would work as well. And we hear back from patients all the time that naloxone you prescribed me, I saved someone, I used, I used it and I saved someone's life. And I just get, you know, I get goosebumps every time I hear that because it's really empowering for that person. And without that naloxone, someone may have lost their life. Um, we take a team-based approach. So we have a group of providers, physicians, nurse practitioners, and PAs, um, who work with, with nurses as well as administrative team members. And we're a team and that means we all um, kind of approach patient care in a similar way because we know if that front desk person isn't empowered in the same way providers are and the person calls, you know, and, and they have a tough um, discussion, you know, that could turn someone off and, and lead to them not engaging in care. So every step of the way is critical and we need to value um, our administrative team workers, you know, with reflecting the incredible contributions they make to patient care. Uh, we, we, uh, I'm actually the signing provider right now, I'm on call. So we know that people need buprenorphine, they need access to it. So we have to be very, very um, organized um, about how we get people treatment. Um, and we have to provide integrated care that's convenient and accessible. Um, this term low threshold gets used frequently, uh, but has actually been defined in the literature by Aaron Fox, one of my uh, mentors um, from Montefiore, who's a, a leader in the field as well. And they define it as an approach that provides consistent medication access. Treatment should be easy for patients to start and continue. That's it. Um, you know, same day entry, someone calls, we need to be able to see them at the same day. Harm reduction approach, that really means a non-abstinence only based approach that's flexible and convenient. And really this describes, in my opinion, high quality healthcare. So we can learn a lot from this type of care delivery as it applies to other healthcare settings. And what services do we provide at REACH? We provide medication for opioid use disorder with buprenorphine, primary care, acute care, hep C testing and treatment, street outreach, uh, lead case management, lead is law enforcement assisted diversion. It's a federal program that's a pre-rest diversion approach, PrEP, PEP, HIV care, integrated behavioral health with counselor, social worker, psychologist, and psychiatric nurse practitioner, OOP, which is opioid overdose prevention training. So we have Narcan provided to us by New York State. We train ourselves, our patients, other community members, and we distribute Nar Narcan to anyone who will have it and we have embedded case management. And just briefly mentioned our transition to COVID, we aggress aggressively transitioned to telemedicine um, and we have, we have implemented really successfully um, outreach facilitated telemedicine. So our outreach workers go out to homeless encampments or other um, forms of temporary housing where patients live with a smartphone and can allow patients to engage in telemedicine who may otherwise not be able to. We've been able to expand our access to rural counties through telemedicine. 
Um, and other outreach services have been implemented like hep C testing, hepatitis A vaccination, COVID testing and COVID vaccination. Um, our, you know, this is sort of a look at our numbers. Um, on the top is the number of unique patients we saw by month, uh, which is around a thousand most months um, um, that we see each month. Our no-show rate was low before COVID and it's been as, you know, it's been around 10%. We see between 30 and 50 pa new patients a month, most months, and our six month retention rate is over 70%. So, you know, we, we're really um, obsessed with um, sorry, with, you know, basically providing compassionate, flexible care to our patients, getting them access to buprenorphine, to naloxone, to hepatitis C testing and treatment, um, and any other medical care they might need, as well as behavioral health services. There we go, I was trying to find the stop share. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffin. We uh, will open um, for questions. Um, let me start uh, by this, uh, Dr. Griffin. Uh, this, this question is based on a, um, a paper I read probably 10 years ago. Uh, so we have 500, 400 million people live in the country, and that's roughly about 5% of the world's population. But um, the uh, opioid use, the medical opioid use in the United States is roughly 70% of the world's medical uh, legal use. How do you explain that? Um, I don't know that I can adequately explain that um, fully. And I would invite anyone else who wants to chime in to do so. You know, I think that what we saw in the late 90s, as you know, most people at this point are aware, was this sort of shift in mentality around pain management pain was perceived, was sort of marketed as the, as a new vital sign and pain was aggressively treated with opioids under the false and really predatory and um, deceitful statements from pharmaceutical companies like Purdue Pharmaceutical that these were safe um, medications without potential for addiction. So, you know, I think it's, it's complicated. I do think that you know, it's obviously a driver of the, the origins of the opioid epidemic. But what we see today is that prescription opioids are not the main driver of overdose death. Um, illicit synthetic opioids are, and that the supply side interventions on the part of the healthcare industry, you know, haven't reduced overdose death. Overdoses have increased in spite of those su supply side interventions. So, you know, it's just something to be aware of. And, you know, pain management is a, is a whole, it's a complex, um, multifaceted condition and, and issue. So, you know, I think it's worthwhile asking ourselves that, like, why, why do we have so much opioid prescribing compared to the rest of the world? But I definitely don't, don't have a specific answer. Thank you. It's like Dr. Ramsey has a question. Dr. Ramsey, if you want to go on ahead and unmute yourself. Actually, I, it's not a question. Um, great job, Judy. I was just going to actually comment on the previous question that, um, I, I mean, I do think it's multifactorial and um, I see it as really, we, we are a culture of despair, um, honestly. I think that the values in our current culture um, are not, um, soul driving. <laughs> let's just, let's just be simple about it. And so I think that, um, people are seeking something and they don't know what, and if they happen to, um, get exposed to substances and in, we've done, a, as Judy explained, a ton of overprescribing, um, that plays into if someone already has, 
say underlying low, low, low lying depression, or they've had some trauma in their past, et cetera, then opioids were a pretty happy solution. So it may have started as a pain issue or, you know, even an acute pain that would have resolved. But um, once you give somebody opioids, you turn on, I mean, any substance, but we're talking specifically about opioids, you turn on a reward pathway that's very difficult to turn off. And I think of opioids as a huge hammer for anything that you're feeling, whether it's physical pain, psychological pain, um, you're trying to not to remember that trauma or other experiences you've had in your life, it dulls anything bad that you're experiencing or feeling. And so that becomes a pretty intoxicating um, solution. Yeah, totally agree with all of that. And also just a, almost a relief of suffering to put it another way, just, you know, any form of suffering and, and people suffer a lot. And this relates to, you know, our overall orientation as a society around crime and punishment, you know, that people's existences actually being in, like living in poverty, being poor is criminalized and, you know, our entire framework centers on sort of good and bad behaviors. And so, you know, I think there's a lot to unpack there sociologically, I'm sure. But one thing I want to highlight, and I was thinking sort of about this question ahead of time, because you and I had discussed it, Dr. Sammy, is, you know, all of that is true, but what physicians should really be held accountable for is their failure at this time to offer evidence-based solutions. Like we need accountability for the past. We need to ask ourselves why opioids are so prevalent. But on the other hand, we need to act. We have solutions. They're evidence-based, safe and effective, wildly impactful on mortality and morbidity interventions. If we had treatments that led to the kind of outcomes that MOUD do, if we had those treatments for any other leading killer like cancer, heart disease, you know, this would be, these would be the blockbuster drugs of the millennium, but they're neglected by healthcare. So that's, I would like to see the the conversation focus on, we need to be offering this to everyone who walks through our doors who may have an opioid use disorder. They have to receive naloxone. They have to receive the offered access to MOUD. They have to be, have choice um, in terms of what type of treatment they need. um, And they need support. And they need love, you know, that's, they need care and they need love. It's just, there's just one, and I completely 100% agree with Judy. The, the other thing that I would add to that is this is the only chronic disease that we ask how long should a person be on medication? We don't do that with any other chronic disease and that completely has to do with stigma. So we don't say to our patient with diabetes, well, it's been six months aren't you ready to get off that insulin? Or it's been two years and you've been on your antihypertensive uh, medication. I think that's far long enough. Let's get you off of it. And that's what happens every day to patients with opioid use disorder. They're told they should get off of their medication by somebody, whether it's a medical provider, a family member, somebody at AA or NA. The criminal justice system. Yeah, yeah a judge tells them they need, should get off yeah. their medication. Dr. Danoff, I see you with your hand raised. Um, did you want to join the conversation? Uh, I um, I would just, I guess, like to be a little bit more radical um, than I, I very much appreciate the comments that are made. And I couldn't agree more that it's critically important that when you have a patient uh, in front of you with a problem, you have to address it in the most evidence-based way possible. So I applaud you for all of that. And it sounds like you're doing an amazing job uh, in terms of uh, you know, reaching out and retaining patients. The political thing is, I think it's also really important to be very um, brutally honest with ourselves about the medical industrial complex and You've, you've said it, but I'm saying it again, and I hope saying it even louder. What pharma did um, and what some of us as providers accepted unquestioningly in terms of prescribing opiates for patients, um, even before there was evidence, you know, there wasn't even evidence that opiates were 
the best approach to most acute pain management. And yet we all sort of accepted that and wrote these scripts and so forth. Some people did horrible things like, you know, um, mills where they would prescribe yeah. such. So I think it's really important because I think that um, it's one example of quite a few examples that Western medicine has accepted that kind of behavior. We, you know, with smoking, um, we're well aware that cigarettes were um, were advertised to underserved people and to veterans and so forth. So I think some soul searching is really important. Um, I don't know what the next one is that they're going to try to shove down our throats and our patients' throats, but I think it's really important to keep our eyes and ears open. This was not random, and it, and and I'm an endocrinologist, and I've sat through lots of lectures about about addictive behavior and that sort of thing, and I, I think that's really important and really interesting, but but our culture, and that's why it's such a bigger epidemic here than it is in other countries, our culture has been permitting this. And I trained at Monty a long time before you did. <laughs> so I have a lot of friends in social medicine and, you know, I, I, it's sad, you know, it's sad that, you know, people who have such good hearts and minds, we're, we're still seeing this kind of behavior. And, and I'll, I don't mean to rant on. Can I just add one little tiny tidbit that has very esoteric, which is, again, I'm an endocrinologist. There's a really great paper in JC, Journal of Clinical Endocrine and Metabolism that it was a meta-analysis that showed that of um, men taking chronic opioids, um, the incidence, the prevalence of um, hypogonadism was as high as 63%. And so one could kind of presume that bone disease probably is also something that some of the people with opiate use disorder are suffering. Um, so, so reproductive health and bone health are really important. And in addition, not so high, but a significant number of people when carefully tested also have adrenal insufficiency. So just a little bit of a, a lot of people aren't so aware of that hypogonadism and adrenal insufficiency. The hypogonadism has only been looked at in men, not so rigorously in women, but it seems pretty, pretty significant. Thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you, Dr. Dana, for that. I just wanted, we ha just wanted to do a check. This is Amanda. We have five, five minutes remaining. So um, Dr. Griffin or Dr. Ramsey, if um, you want to follow up, but there are some pe a couple of people unmuted. So I just wanted them to have a chance to ask a question or participate as well. So if you're unmuted, please um, feel free to join. I'll just put in a plug for education and training because, you know, I trained at Montefiore. Seems like, you know, several other people here did or work there. And, you know, people at Montefiore have been talking about this for decades. I mean, you know, this is not new, but here we are. And like literally hundreds of thousands of people have died. And I, you know, I, obviously it's the medical industrial complex, capitalism and medicine, you know, these all impact how we practice and certainly are drivers of the, the current opioid overdose epidemic in part, no doubt. Um, but I think, you know, I'm happy to see some of our Cuga Medical Center residents here today. Really appreciate you guys coming because I think teaching people and providing uh, training, exposure to this type of approach can have uh, such uh, waves throughout. You know, when I look at my co-residents or folks who've worked at Monty across the country, you know, who are doing this type of work, they're, they're the leaders in this. And so um, my hope would be that maybe ACP would advocate for that type of uh, training and exposure for internal medicine residents and internists, you know, as you are today. I think it's critical. Very good point, Dr. Griffin. Thank you. Do you have I, any other questions? I'll just make a comment. This is Roy Korn uh, in uh, Cobblestone, New York. And when I started work here, 
um, a decade, a few decades ago, I, I was blown away by the number of patients I inherited who were taking chronic opioids and also chronic benzos. Um, I, you know, I, I really wasn't exposed that much to that during my residency, and then, and um, and that was thirty years ago. But, um, so it's been a problem for a long time. That's a great point. And can I just mention that I met Dr. Corin when I was a medical student at Columbia when I did my primary care rotation in Cobalt Skill. You probably don't remember me because there are a lot of students, but I remember you and, and I worked with Joe Seller and, you know, incredible work that Bassett Healthcare has been doing in upstate New York. Um, and I just want to just acknowledge that, you know, um, great to see you. And I like the point that this is not new. I mean, I think when you actually look at, at populations and I think there's a lot more awareness and obviously the number of overdose deaths has gone up, but this has been a problem continuously and it's been ignored. And I think a lot of that has to do with who has been impacted um, and who are those, you know, what are the power invested in those populations? But, um, but thank you for coming. Great to see you. I think Griffin, we have a few questions. Uh, one from um, Olga. How do you do reach telemedicine visits? Do you visit them at home? Um, what do you do? So we use a free platform called doxy.me. It's not doximity, but doxy.me that is, is really easy to use. But we basically, we have like um, a really well-oiled machine where, you know, we have scheduled appointments. Um, patients get a call from our nurse to do a brief intake. So if they're scheduled to see me, the nurse will call them, you know, ask them how they're doing, chief complaint, et cetera. And then once the nurse is done talking to them, they, we have a text-based communication thread. The administrative front desk person will text or email them the link to the encounter. They show up in my waiting room and I see them. I see you know, a lot of patients. We have a, a really high volume um, and it works pretty well. We do transition to telephone um, and about 20, 25% of our appointments uh, at times are telephone-based. Um, and we've done some analysis of that patients who need a telephone versus telemedicine uh, just, you know, relates to the social determinants of health, employment, housing, age over 50 mobility. So telemedicine has been huge in expanding access to care um, throughout the pandemic for our patients. Siva Harsha asks a question. Um, please comment on the role of the hospitalist in treating OUD. Amazing question and super important. You know, uh, I would say just being familiar with and comfortable prescribing MOUD, and, and Kelly could add to this, I'd invite her to, but identifying patients who are hospitalized related to OUD or SUD, offering them buprenorphine or methadone, depends on your community, and, and making sure they're working with a social worker or a peer or someone that can help support them as they transition to the community. And, and I think also the role of being anti-stigma making sure our patients who are in the hospital who have OUD are not, we're not perpetuating harm or stigma. So you, you know, providing um, compassionate, welcoming care to them in the hospital setting means that they'll go back. I'm a community-based provider. I see someone who, you know, we see like septic patients at, at our doorstep and they won't go to the, you know, they're like over my dead body. Will I go back to the hospital? And they mean it. So, you know, hospitalists can, can play a huge role in changing that dynamic. All right, let me ask James Paul to jump in. We're running out of time. James? Maybe he's muted. James, you raised your hand. Okay. So there are a few comments that worth mentioning. Um, um, uh, Kenneth says that he decreased and stopped medications for hypertension and diabetes and other chronic conditions. Likewise, um, he has decreased and stopped uh, suboxone and buprenorphine when patients no longer need them. So, you know, uh, for sure, this is debatable. Uh, do you want to make a comment about it, Dr. Griffin? Or uh, Yeah, I would Nancy? just say, you know, there are a subset of patients, whether it's 10%, you know, around 10% of patients who can maintain long-term recovery without, uh, without medications for opioid use disorder. And I tell people that uh, my fear 
and I tell people this is, I don't know which, are you in the 90% who will relapse and potentially die? Or are you the 10% who could, and we, we can try tapers and see how you do. Let's go slow. Let's communicate, uh, take a patient centered approach. Um, same with, you know, hypertension medications, diabetes medications. I, I don't have a ton of patients that I've ever successfully stopped their medications, but you have a subset of people who lose a lot of weight, totally change their lifestyle, maintain that over time. That's ex it's extremely rare in my experience, but it's, it's possible. I'm Again. just going to add, can I just have one thing to what Judy said? Please. So I've been treating substance use disorder for 17 years. Um, so it has been the bulk of my practice along with HIV and hepatitis C. And I have stopped, I've worked both in an OTP as a medical director in an OTP. So with doing both methadone and buprenorphine as well as buprenorphine in, in an FQHC. And yes, I've had a handful of patients that have stopped either methadone or buprenorphine. But as Judy said, that is not the vast majority of patients. And so it's really important to recognize that and to not um, maybe put your goals for the patient over perhaps what the patient's goals are. And just I would just add, you know, this is a chronic disease and I, I've known multiple people, you know, come to mind, including unfortunately today, I learned, you know, we learned that the family member of one of our staff who had had long-term abstinence-based recovery from opioid use overdosed and died yesterday. Um, and so this is a chronic condition with lifelong implications and it's life or death. So for me, the, the stakes are so high that the idea of tapering people off medications is something that needs to be be addressed, you know, undertaken with tremendous caution. And in and with a lot of harm reduction, naloxone prescribing, you know, um, teaching that your tolerance will be different, all of these safer uh, use interventions that can reduce um, overdose risk. So, all right. Any other questions, James? Are you coming back? So, all right, it's uh, four after six. Um, I think during this meeting, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Griffin, uh, for this uh, educational talk. And um, uh, Amanda, had, Amanda Allen had provided you with um, my and her contact. We are um, looking forward to hearing from you. Um, any uh, one in the audience who has a topic, who has a thought, um, just please reach out to us. And uh, again, thank you so much. And we're looking forward to future meetings.